Welcome back, my friends, to the Chinese Sayings Podcast. Laszlo Montgomery with you once again, bringing you another jewel of a Chengyu. One, I may say, that mixes well with a previous selection from this season, Tao Yuan Jie Yi. And the story behind our Chengyu for this one, too, takes place during those fabled decades lasting from 220 to 280, when the once unified China was broken up into three kingdoms of Shu Han, Cao Wei, and Eastern Wu. Plenty of gilded Chengyus came out of that age, including this one, Ren Ru Fu Chong. This is one of those idioms that, well, when we break it down, it sort of gives the meaning away. But what a great story. How could I not tell it? Ren Ru Fu Chong. Let's give it a once over. Ren as a verb means to bear or endure or put up with. And ru means disgrace or dishonor as a noun or a verb. And fu means to carry on the back or shoulder or to shoulder or bear. And zhong means weight or weighty in the sense of important. Endure disgrace, carry a heavy burden on your back or a weighty responsibility. Well, you can get the main idea, but without attaching a story to it, these are just mere words. So let's all grab our copies of the San Guo Chi off the shelf once more with feeling. The record of the three kingdoms to the Wu Shu, the Book of Wu, to the chapter of the life of Lu Xun. Not the great 20th century literary figure, Lu Xun. Our hero for this story was surnamed Lu, not Lu. And he was a major figure in the kingdom of Eastern Wu. So the story goes like this. Following the decisive Battle of Red Cliffs, 208-209 AD, conditions were ripe amongst the three kingdoms for direct confrontation. Following this Battle of Red Cliffs, Cao Cao's mighty Wei army was taken down a few pegs and a little bit less of a threat. But tensions between Sun Quan of Wu and Liu Bei of Shu were only intensifying. Sun Quan wanted back a territory he had temporarily leased to Shu. This was Jingzhou, located in southern Hubei. But Guan Yu, who had been assigned by Liu Bei to guard the territory, refused to return the land. So when Guan Yu was away doing battle with Cao Cao's forces in Xiangyang, today Hubei's second largest city, Sun Quan took his officer Lu Xun's advice and mounted a sneak attack to regain Jingzhou, when Guan Yu hurried back to defend the territory, he was killed by Sun Quan's forces. And when this news reached Liu Bei, he was furious, and right then and there vowed to avenge Guan Yu's death by destroying the state of Wu, ignoring the advice of his best officials, including Zhuge Liang. He led more than a 100,000 troops in a full-scale eastwards invasion of Wu, this new state of affairs caused Sun Quan much anxiety. He recognized that this was a matter of life or death for Wu. Its borders were threatened from the north by Cao Cao and now encroached upon by Liu Bei from the west as well. In an effort to halt this oncoming invasion, Sun Quan sent multiple emissaries to try and reason with Liu Bei. After all, Sun Quan and Liu Bei had allied together to defeat Cao Cao at the Battle of Red Cliffs. But each time, Liu Bei, still mourning the death of his sworn brother Guan Yu, rebuffed Sun Quan's overtures, and the Shu army continued to advance further into Wu lands. At this critical juncture, Sun Quan realized that there was only one general who could save Wu. This was his go-to guy for all important and critical matters, Lu Xun. He assigned a force of 50,000 men to accompany Lu Xun with orders to meet Liu Bei's forces head-to-head -head in battle. Before Lu Xun set off, Sun Quan took off the precious sword hanging at his own side and presented it to him, saying, Use this well in your camp. At the time, Lu Xun was still quite a young man. Besides, he came from a, a scholarly background, and joining him to lead the Wu forces were experienced generals, many of them well-connected among the aristocracy who had seen battle since the days of Sun Quan's elder brother, Sun Ce. Of course, to these generals, Lu Xun was a mere upstart, and they grumbled about why did he get this important command. 
By 222 AD, Liu Bei's force of well over 100,000 men had penetrated five or 600 Li into Wu territory. Liu Bei's army had also managed to besiege one of Sun Quan's best generals, his nephew Sun Huan in Yidao, also in today's Hubei province. Meanwhile, when this news reached Lu Xun, all the other generals with him advised him to go to Sun Huan's aid. Lu Xun, however, said confidently, General Sun is perfectly capable of directing his troops during a siege, and the fort of Yidao is well supplied. We need to focus on winning here. If we do that, Sun Huan's problem will solve itself. The generals did not argue with Lu Xun's decision, but they were uneasy at heart. Lu Xun pitched camp at Yiling, also in Hubei, a critical position right across from the camp of the Shu forces. He ordered his men to begin building fortifications and defenses right away. The Shu forces, seeing Lu's army camped right across from them, began itching for a battle. Every day they came up close to the Wu camp, yelling all manner of insults and trying to goad the Wu forces into violence. But Lu Xun refused to send so much as a single Wu soldier to engage the Shu army. Eventually, his generals grew impatient and flooded into Lu Xun's tent, all but ordering him to give the command to engage. Lu Xun would not budge. He said, Liu Bei's forces are flush with victory from their advance east into Wu's borders. Their morale is high, and they occupy an advantageous position. We will never succeed in routing them if we attack now. All we can do is strengthen our own position and wait for the right moment. At this, the generals broke out into a storm of protesting. They thought Lu Xun was behaving in a cowardly manner and being too overly cautious for first refusing to help break Sun Huan out of his siege, and then for refusing to engage the belligerent Shu Han army. So loudly did the generals argue that Lu Xun had to slap the table for attention. I may be a scholar and not military men like you, he said, but I was chosen by the commander-in-chief for one reason, and that is, I can endure any indignity and bear any responsibility to see this mission out to a successful end. That's right. This is where Lu Xun let it be known he was willing to Ren Ru Fu Zhong. He was just fine with suffering these insults from Shu for the sake of the ultimate objective, that being defeating them in battle. Lu Xun continued, My orders are not to engage, and anyone who goes against my will can contend with the commander-in-chief's sword. And saying this, he unsheathed the sword Sun Quan had given him. Although the generals were still unhappy, no one wanted to go against such a threat. And so, for four long months, from February to June, the Wu army did not emerge from their encampment and did not respond to the Shu army's taunts. In June, the famous Hubei weather began to change, and it grew unbearably hot. In order to escape from the relentless Hubei sun, Liu Bei had to lead his forces away from the open into a forested area to seek shade. By this time, the Shu forces were spread out amongst 40 interconnected camps stretching across 700 li of Wu territory. That's about 375 kilometers. This was the moment that Lu Xun had been waiting for. The weather was hot and dry, and the Shu forces were spread out way too thinly over too large a space. Lu Xun waited for a night when the wind was in the east and began his attack. He had an advance guard of men sneak up on the Shu camp with bundles of kindling, and at a single command, all the bundles were set on fire. And soon the Shu camp was ablaze, and the hot, dry weather, the east wind, and the forested setting meant that the fire spread quickly westward, igniting other Shu military camps. The Shu army was plunged into confusion, and the Wu forces gave chase. In fact, Wu forces had little to do but mop up after the fire, as one Shu camp after another fell to the flames. Since Liu Bei had spread his men over such a large territory, communications were sparse. But since all the camps were still technically connected, the fire could spread as it liked. 
Sun Huan, marveling at the success of Lu Xun's plan, chose this time, when Liu Bei could not possibly send reinforcements, to break the Shu siege at Yidou, and the remains of Liu Bei's army, retreating westwards, found their path blocked off by Sun Huan. After this turn of events, it was Liu Bei and not Sun Quan who was in a desperate position. Great generals of Shu had either lost their lives or been captured by Wu, not to mention the massive casualties and loss of equipment amongst the rest of the Shu army. Liu Bei beat a sorry retreat to Baidi City in today's Chongqing, where, weighed down by sorrows, he died the following year. So this four-character Cheng Yu comes to us from this famous time of battles in Jing province, today's Hubei. Anyone, including yourself, who is willing to bite their tongue and suffer humiliation or abuse for the sake of laying low until it's the right time to strike, are Ren Ru Fu Zhong. The great Pleco app explains it as enduring humiliation as part of an important mission. Our English equivalent might be to suffer in silence, or suffer in silence for the sake of a higher objective. Ren Ru Fu Zhong. That's our Cheng Yu for this time. Once again, Emma, despite her hectic schedule, has been keeping everyone in the Cheng Yu Yan Jiu Zhongxin operating at full efficiency. Thanks, Emma, once again. Wow, the season is now half over. Can you believe it? Time flies when you're having fun, doesn't it? Okay, that's all I got for you this time. Thanks for listening. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from our recording studios in Los Angeles, California. Do consider joining me next time, if you can, for another exciting episode of the Chinese Sayings Podcast.